things that, that we are so thankful for is that uh, uh, one of our young missionaries has returned. Uh, that's Dale Kalusik. He came back last week uh, from Ponape, but he's going to come up and share a little bit right now. So just welcome him home. He's doing double duty. You know, we're, gonna, we're putting him to work right away. We gave him one week off, and then now he's, he's going to be like, we're working him. Because we know that he learned over there in Ponape with Johnny and Kat. He learned, well, he already knew, but he, he learned how to work, you know, in 99% humidity and 98 degree weather. Yeah, so this is a breeze, right? Gets to be in here on a soundboard in an air-conditioned uh, sanctuary, that's great. So anyway, I just, I wanted to ask you, I want to ask you, um, you know, before you went, you kind of had a picture in your mind about what it would be like, but when you got there, what was it like? What was kind of like the difference between how you thought it would be and how it was? Well, um, I guess first off, I thought everything was going to be okay. <laughs> and as I learned, everything's not always okay. <laughs> We had a lot of hardships. I left with my friend Ian from my high school, and we left here on August 20th, and we arrived in Ponape on August 22nd. So we got there, and we were immediately taken to a hotel. We checked in, and then we went to go look at our new living facilities where we would be staying for the next nine months, and all we saw were concrete walls. <laughs> and so it's like a like a cell, right? <laughs> yeah. For the first month we were there, we stayed at a hotel and it, everything moved very fast. Uh we were working 14-hour days finishing our apartment, um electrical, plumbing, everything, anything. So we got to do a lot of work um so, so, so what were some of the things that you, you participated in some of the, while well, you worked, but what kind of work did you did, do and how did you, how did you participate with Mahi International, with Johnny and Kat? Mahi basically is out in Ponape for education and health. Um, Ian and I went out there to participate in health, uh, getting our EMT certificates and working in the hospitals and in the ambulance that was donated. So we went out there, and our class was supposed to start in September, ended up starting late April. So we were there for a while Typical. doing anything that Mahi or John or Kat had asked us to do, um, working on their house, getting it prepared for more volunteers, working in the hospital, unloading containers, donations, Pretty much anything. So, so did, while you were there, did you do any, like, stuff that doctors do here, but over there you have to do it? You know? Some. We weren't trained to the <laughs> level of a doctor, but we did, um, when, when working in the hospital at the end of our stay there, uh, a, lot of, a lot of diabetic patients yeah. um, that we took care of. Okay. Uh, so... I, I just remember some of the stories Johnny told us about, you know, pulling teeth and doing things that in this country he'd be arrested for doing, but over oh, there. He had to do because no one else was around. He probably did a few of those, but we don't want to put you in any legal liability. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I had asked Dale to think of one or two uh, experiences that really stood out in his mind, and I don't know what you came up with, but... Well, I guess um, one of the first experiences, church there isn't like church here. Church here is very welcoming and open and, and family. Church there is very, you're not one of us, but you can come and sit here. So it, it felt a little, a little different. But, you know, after time, we, we got to visit and see the people more. So really, on our Sabbath, we like to spend... We would go out to one of the smaller islands and just sit and enjoy God's creations, water, land, anything. So that, that was a big, big thing. A anything else? Any, any like interaction or any other, um, any other big thing that, that you can share with us? 
I know I know your moms are here. Yeah. But. <laughs> um, pretty much. I mean, you're you're all in one piece, so yeah. you didn't do anything that you know I, severed a limb or anything like. I that. I tried to stay in one piece most of the time. I ended up getting very sick um, once and was hospitalized for about four days. Um, I jumped off a waterfall and badly injured my ankle on some rocks. <laughs> so. I tried to stay in one piece, but uh, didn't work out always. <laughs> well, Dale, we're so glad you're back home, man. And uh, you guys just give him some thanks. After, after church today, we had a graduation ceremony from uh, San Antonio Christian School on Wednesday night, and they left us a great big graduation cake. So we're going to just pretend like it says graduation and welcome home Dale from Ponape. So after church, go out there and eat some cake and talk to Dale. Maybe he'll share with you some of the more exciting experiences. <laughs> so, and, and we're going to show you a little slideshow of, of uh, the, the island. you're back and that it's it's really a privilege to count you as part of our family you know Dale's brother Wesley uh, went to Ponape the year before and now he's in the Marines so I don't know what the future holds for Dale but you know one of the things that is so uh, awesome for me is to see uh, young people who have a heart for God and really want to step out and do something so Dale thank you for setting an example for us appreciate that uh, as I mentioned earlier, Thanksgiving is still almost six months away, but, but we're going to talk about it today. To be more precise, we're talking about giving thanks in the context of worship. How many of you are thankful this morning? After that worship set of songs, uh, you better raise your hand. <laughs> what are you thankful for? At Thanksgiving time, you hear a lot of be thankful talk. Everyone is encouraged to be thankful. Christians, Jews, Mormons followers of Islam, agnostics, 
even atheists, everyone. The focus is on how one should feel or the attitudes that we should have. You've heard of having an attitude of gratitude, right? And and there's no doubt that focusing on the positive things in our lives, the good, the blessings, the comforts, the freedoms, focusing on on that is good for us and it's good for other people. So I I don't want to take anything away from that. There's actually, uh, I understand, a physiological benefit to maintaining a positive mental attitude. They say that, you know, more endorphins are released in your brain and you feel better and you relate to the world better and, and all of that. Giving thanks in worship, though, is not about a feeling or an attitude as much as it is about an act. Oh, yeah, that's the series we're in. <laughs> Acts of worship. Because worship is about the things we do in our relationship and service to God. Giving thanks in this context is for believers. An an atheist uh, may be thankful, but he cannot give thanks to God because if he did, then he wouldn't be an atheist, would he? (laughs) I don't know. I just thought that was funny. I I mean, that'd be a good thing. It's not that I think, you know, it's a bad thing, but it's for people who believe. So today we want to focus specifically on the whole idea of thanking God. Thanks as the third act of worship, A-C-T-S, is completely grounded in our faith in Jesus Christ. To treat thanksgiving as if it were just one of the positive emotions Christians should have is, is really an incomplete picture of Christian gratitude at best, but it really actually does an injustice to the one who is our life, our hope, and our salvation. Listen to what Paul says will lead us to a a thankful heart. This comes from Colossians 2. Just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth that you were taught and you will, read it with me, overflow with thankfulness. I was going to say thanksgiving, but thankfulness. You will overflow with thankfulness. Thanks as a part of worship comes from being connected to Jesus. In fact, Paul says that if I am growing as a follower of Jesus, then I will overflow with thankfulness. I'll overflow. David also describes the same kind of thing in Psalm 28. This is what he says. The Lord is my strength and shield. I trust him with all my heart. He helps me and my heart is filled with joy. I burst out in songs of thanksgiving. Today we came close to bursting out, I think. I'm not sure if we actually reached that, but it came close. It was was awesome. Are you bursting out in song today, songs of thanksgiving today? Actually, I want, want you to think right now about the opposite of what you're thankful for. I want you to think about what's bugging you. What is there in your life or your experience that's irritating you right now, today? What are you angry about? What are you sad about? What are you worried about? What battles are you fighting with your spouse or your relatives or your boss or your children? It might not be a bad idea for you to write them down. Make a list. On the back side of your outline, there's a little empty space there. You could write a few of them down. It's okay. Identify them. In fact, I know that in this room right now, there is a lot of consternation. Now, that's kind of an old word, you know. Consternation. I've had, I have consternation. <laughs> Sounds southern to me. But, but it, it, it's full of... Uh, full of meaning. It's, it's, it, it means I have dread or I have worry or dismay or trepidation or bewilderment. There's a pile of trouble here today that you all have brought here. And you're sitting here with all of that. Now, that's okay. It's okay because the Bible says and Jesus says, come to me, everyone who's carrying burdens. So it's appropriate that you come with all of that. But most of you are not doing anything about it. I'm, I'm just kind of guessing here, but I've you know, been around long enough, 
know a little bit about human nature and certainly know myself well enough to know that we, we don't often do a lot about the stuff that's weighing us down. We just carry it. Some of you actually came here today with a pile of stuff and you're going to leave with it. <laughs> you're going to leave with it. Paul says that Christians who are growing in a deeper relationship with Jesus will overflow with thanksgiving. David says his heart is filled with joy. He's bursting out in songs of thanksgiving. If the weight of all the things, everything that troubles you today stays on you, how can you possibly give God thanks? Is your thanks a thank you God, thank you God for, and you fill in the blank. Thank you for this or that, whatever it might be for you. But, Lord, I'm, I'm really upset or down or worried or anxious or depressed. You know, you, you understand what I'm saying? In other words, you say, thank you, God, but, or thank you, God, and I need you to think, I need you to, you know, look at these things because uh, I, I'm really burdened down with them. I'm really pressed down with what's troubling me in my life. The very nature of saying thank you sincerely is that you focus on what someone else has done or said or given to you that elicits a response of appreciation. Real thank yous are not about you. A real thank you is not about me. It's about our benefactor. And who's our benefactor? As Christians, isn't it Jesus Christ? Isn't it our Heavenly Father? Thank you, but is not really a thank you. It's, it's just performing a duty so you can get back to your misery. So I don't want to focus on all of that, but I just want to bring it out. <laughs> because I don't think we can really understand what it means to thank God unless we identify the stuff that's weighing us down and that keeps us from being thankful. So I thought of three reasons I, I can thank God today. And there may be some overlap in these areas, and, you know, it could, might be organized in a different way if someone else were doing it. But, but I tried to be very specific about thanks in the context of worship. These areas help me identify ways that God has acted toward me and, and that are so amazing and so huge that they demand a heartfelt thank you. The first one is this. Thank him for what he has given us. Thank him for what he's given us. Now, I know that sounds like, oh, yeah, duh, you know. But I want you to focus a little bit on, on what God really has given us. And I, I thought of, of where it all comes from. So I went to uh, Genesis 2. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the, uh, of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and man became a living person. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he made. <laughs> God gave you... And he gave me life. He gave us breath. He gave us being. It didn't just happen. You didn't just happen. God gave you life. Years ago, I was talking with a friend about some stuff I was going through during a very difficult time in my life. Um, I was going through a, a divorce. And uh, it was painful. I was tortured, emotionally tortured for days on end at times. But I remember saying to him, you know, I'd rather have the pain than have nothing. At least if I have pain, I know I'm alive. <laughs> now, I wish that I could have always maintained that attitude. Unfortunately, there were times during that period and times since when, when I, I felt like I was dying inside, when I wasn't sure I could keep going on. And I am so thankful today to God that I am alive because he has given me life. Being alive means that I can see. It means that I can hear. It means that I can think. It means that I can create and share and sing and write and serve and love. It means that I can feel. That I can know and be known. God gave each one of you life the oxygen that you are all sucking into your lungs right now is a gift from God. Have you thanked him today for it? I mean, we kind of like take that for granted. Yeah, God gave us this and that and the other thing. But have you actually taken the time, stopped your regular 
activities, kind of set aside those big piles of burdens you're carrying and say, thank you, God, for the breath that I have. Thank you for the, the beating of my heart today. Thank you, God. God gave us a home. That passage we just read said God placed uh, Adam and Eve in the garden. Well, Eve hadn't, wasn't there yet. You know, Later on in that same chapter, he talks about how he, he gave Eve a rib, I guess. <laughs> and he made Eve. And, 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 and it, the Bible says he gave them a garden. He gave them a place. He gave them a home. He gave us all a home. You know what it's called? Planet Earth. Planet Earth. It's a wonderful place. It's a, a beautiful blue planet teeming with life. I know it's also full of sadness and disease and tragedy and pain, but that's all the enemy's doing, and it's, and it's our doing as we have succumbed to him. And even in all of that, God's gift shines through. Just sit out here, back of the church, this afternoon if you have some time, or maybe at home you might have some trees. Just sit out under the sycamores and just hear the, the music of the wind. Hear the birds singing. Look at the blue sky. Watch the butterflies, which a lot of you, when you get bored, you do here during the summertime anyway. Feel the warmth of the sun. I went outside last night and, and, and just looked up at the full moon. Anybody see the, the moon? I don't know if it's technically full, but it, I could see all the margins anyway. It was so bright, you know, and it's funny. It's the same moon that's been there since I was a little kid. I remember riding with my folks in a car in the days when it was okay to sleep in the back window of the car, you know. And, uh, and I'd look out the back window as we were driving along some highway, and there's the moon. It's kind of following us. When, uh, when Diane and I were, we began to ride each other from one part of the country to the other, there were times when we, we both saw the same moon at the same time at night. What a wonder. What a beauty. Thank you, God. Thank you for this home, temporary though it may be. He has given us life, and he has given us a home, and he has given us whatever we need. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 6. Your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you what? Everything you need. Everything you need. <laughs> this week as I was preparing for this message, I realized, and I'm ashamed of this, how much I have focused in my life on what I don't have. You don't have to raise your hand, but I'll bet there's a few of you out there that could say the same thing. I've focused on, been preoccupied with what's not working and with the bad things that are happening in the world and what other people are doing. I've focused on the brokenness of my life and with what I don't have that I have not, I, I've done that so much that I have not identified and thanked God for what he has given, it, given to me. I haven't done that in a way that's proportionate to the gift. You know, if somebody gave you a dollar today, I don't have my wallet, I'd be happy to give you a dollar. I'm not going any higher, though. Tom gave $100 once, I'm not going there. But uh, if I gave... If I received a dollar today from someone just out of the blue, it's like, thank you for that. If I received... $10,000, like, wow, thank you. If I received a million, it's like I'd be all over the place. I don't care what people thought of me. I'd be shouting and screaming and hugging my wife and making her dance, and she'd hurt even more than she hurts now. You know? See, giving God thanks in proportion to what he has given to us, do we do that? I have a beautiful, loving talented wife. God gave her to me. I know he did. He knew that I needed her. I have three beautiful children who are now grown and on their own. And, and that's saying something in a time where a third of all single young adults live at home with their parents. I'm thankful. <laughs> and I pray for some of you. I have three entertaining dogs that do live in my house, or I should say, I live in their house. God, God has given me everything that I need and have needed. He, he knew that I needed a loving, spiritual family. He, he gave me North Hills Church. 
I was thinking on Thursday, or, or I think it was, thir- was Thursday the viewing? On Thursday, after I visited with Debbie and Alan Davis at the funeral home, how much you guys are a part of my family. In 14 years, we've been through and into a lot of stuff together. And, and then I thought about our music and worship team. I thought about Tom and Kay and so many of you, all of you here. And then I thought about Steve. <laughs> uh, it's his birthday, and we already sang happy birthday to him, but I thought about Steve, and I, I know God definitely knew I needed Steve. Thank you, Steve. Where is Steve? There, oh, he's at the camera. Thank you, Steve. Oh, no, there he is. I, you know, I can't, I, I can't see Steve's right here. (laughs) Thank you. You guys have no idea. I mean, so much of what happens here on Sabbath and and at other times, uh, Steve does for us. And uh, God has given him some some amazing gifts. He knew, God knew I needed you, Steve. And, uh, you know, we just don't thank each other and we don't thank God enough and to the degree that he has blessed us. It's not only our breath, but our food and the enjoyment of it that comes from God. And he's given us skilled cooks and bakers to take the raw materials of fruits, grains, nuts, vegetables, and sugar, (laughs) and all foods, and put them together in the most delectable, nourishing, and enjoyable ways. Most of you have enjoyed the, the, the hospitality table that a few of our folks put together. My wife is one of the main ones who bakes every Friday so that you have good things to eat. Most of the stuff doesn't have the label Costco on anything. It has just, you know, fashioned by dye. <laughs> and, and, and we have some of the most amazing cooks here. Has anybody ever had any of, uh, uh, what are those things? Oh, yeah, have any, has anyone ever had one of Jacques crepes? Oh, man, that's good stuff. <laughs> Thank you, God, for our food. Thank you for those who fix it and cook it and bake it and serve it. Thank you, God, for what he... Thank God for what he has given you. Your life, your nourishment, your families. Yes, God has given that to you. And then the the second thing I thought about that, that in worship that we should thank him for, that is for what he has done for us. What has God done for you and for me? Not just what is, what is he given to us, but what has he accomplished on our behalf? Romans 5, 8, and 9. There are so many passages in the Bible that talk about this. In fact, when I, when I looked up the word thanks, and I didn't like restrict it to just exactly thanks, it was like thanksgiving, thanks, thankful, and all that. There was a, exactly 100 verses in, in the NIV that, that uh, have that word in it. But if you put it together with praise... And, and, and sing a new song to the Lord and all the expressions of gratitude to God that the Bible gives. It's way more, the Bible tells us way more to give thanks to God and to praise Him than it does to keep the Sabbath. And yet, it, it seems like for Seventh-day Adventists, we, we put so much on the day and we forget about what we can give to God. When we come, we come to church and, and, and sometimes, honestly, it's like a mausoleum in here. It's like, do you people know whose house this is? Do you know what he's done for you? And I have to confess, you know, speed of the leader, speed of the congregation, I'm the same way. I come and I'm all concerned about doing this and doing that, and I forget who God is, not only what he's given me, but what he has accomplished on my behalf. Listen to this that Paul writes in Romans 5. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. While we were still sinners, God did this. And since we have been made right in God's sight. Now, those of you that are good in English, what's the tense of that, that phrase there? You know what a tense is? What tense is? Not tense. But it's past. It's past. Since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. There are many things God has done for us, but there is one thing that stands out. He saved us. He saved us, past tense. 
He did this by sending Jesus to live on this planet as a human, then die at our hands. Yes, our hands. It was my sin, your sin, the sin of all humanity for all the ages that crushed out the life of Jesus Christ. Through this one act, he made it possible for us to live, not just on this blue planet, but for eternity. But even more, he opened up the way back home, back into his arms. He made us right when we were wrong. He suffered the penalty of my sin so that I could have the privilege of his life. Acceptance with the Father, belonging in the family of God. By this grand saving act, he defeated the enemy on his own ground. He radically changed the direction of human history. Our race, our race was headed for complete termination. That's where we were going. Until Jesus came in and interrupted that direction and he said, look, you can live forever. He brought us back into his family. He made us partners with him in the greatest enterprise ever embarked upon in the universe. Talk about the mission of the the USS Enterprise. This is the JC, uh, let's see, how can we make that? The JCS, Jesus Christ, Savior Enterprise. You can join on, you can get on that ship, and you can go to the ends of the universe to bring the glory of God to all, all created beings, to all creation. And we can start right here, right now, today, because God has given us that privilege. The greatest enterprise ever embarked upon in the universe, the saving of lost and dying sinners. That's what God has called us to. That's the gift he has given us. That's what he has done for us. Paul says in his second letter to Timothy, God saved us and called us to a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it. Are you kidding Not because we deserved it, but because it was his plan from the beginning of time to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. He has shown me, he's shown me grace through Jesus. I don't deserve to live. I don't deserve to stand here week by week and worship with you. I haven't done anything to merit God's approval or or his smile on me. And I certainly don't deserve all the good and perfect gifts that he's given me. But he gave it all to me, and he gave it all to you, and to you, and to you, to each one of you, to all of us, through Jesus Christ, because he created us out of love. His heart was broken. His heart was broken when our ancestors, Adam and Eve, first turned away from him. And he planned from the beginning a way to bring us back. I thank you, God, today for Jesus Christ. I thank you, God, that... that, uh, I thank you, God, that when you healed the lepers, when you forgave and healed the paralytic, when you saved the day at the wedding, when you fed the thousands through a miracle, when you brought Lazarus back to life, when you forgave the sinful woman as well as the proud Pharisee, When Jesus looked into Peter's soul and forgave him for his betrayal and he loved him anyway, he did it, and you did it, God, with me in mind. He knew that I would be lost and sick and rebellious and weak and broken and oh, so full of sin. Yeah, yeah, your preacher's a sinner, by the way, in case you didn't know. But he loved me. He loved me so much. He not only lived for me, he died for me. For all my sins, even the ones I haven't yet committed. And and for my sin, singular, my utter depravity and the lost condition of my soul, he died for me. (laughs) Then he came back to life. And every day he offers me that new life, clean, forgiven, changed, and faithful simply because he loved me and planned from the earliest ages of eternity to do just what he has done. He always knew the lengths to which he would go to save you and me. And he's gone there. He's gone to those lengths. He went to hell and he conquered death and then he came back for our sakes, for our salvation, for our inclusion, for our sanctification, for our reward. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I worship you today for what you've done. You didn't deserve any of what you suffered. I don't deserve any of what you've given me. But you loved us all here so much that you came and you lived and died and rose. And now you work on our behalf through your spirit so that we can live together forever with you. Hallelujah. That is an amen. How about a hallelujah? Hallelujah. All right. Now here we got we to gotta stop. Um, now when you made the list of the burdens... You know, we kind of moved past that and we got to the things. What has God given you? And I hope maybe you listed a few of those things out because what I'm going to ask you to do right now is to do, instead of me just talking about it, let's do it. We've sung songs of praise. We've heard some verses, some passages in the scriptures that talk about thanking God for what he has done for us and what he's given us. So, you know, years ago, we had a, an, an intern here from the seminary. His name was Ray. Some of you remember Ray. And one day he did something in our service. He, he called it a popcorn prayer. I never heard of that before. It's like, what? A popcorn prayer. And what the idea was just that we, as God's family, that we just express our thanks to God specifically. Not generic stuff like, thank you, God for things that we're just trying to pull stuff out of the air, but what has God given you? What has God done for you? I know that, that everyone here could think of at least one thing. Maybe you can think of two or three, or you got a whole list. And so we, I just want to spend a few minutes here letting you express and say thank you, God. And that's, that's how you can do it. Just say thank you, God, for the air that I breathe today. Just do one thing at a time. Now, you can, if, if there's a little silence, we, we can come back to you. You can say more than one thing, but just one at a time. And, and let's, just, let's just let the thanks flow up to our Heavenly Father. You can close your eyes or you can keep them open. I don't think God really cares. What he wants is your heart to be open to him. So let's just do that right now. I'll, I'll start. Thank you, God, for Jesus, my Savior, and for the forgiveness of my sins. Of the resurrection. Amen. For your grace, Lord. Amen. Peace. Amen. Amen. You're enough, God. Amen. I I feel the thanks building here. Come on. Amen. Healthy husband. And beautiful women and wife wives. Thank you, God. Say it again. One wife. Amen. 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 Thank you, God, for finding us. Yes. children. Amen. Oh, praise the Lord for that, for sobriety. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> It's okay, you can clap. Thank God for sobriety. Someone else. What was that? Say it again. Unmeasured love. 
Thank you, God. We're, we're, we're making a big basket, a big thanks basket for God. We're presenting it to him. What do you have to thank him for today? Amen. For the hope that we find in you. Amen. We thank you, God, for restoring Pastor Tom to strength and health. Blessing your family. A couple more. Yes. Amen. The joy of family and friends. Christian fellowship. Fellowship together in Jesus. Christian fellowship. One more. <laughs> thank you for a tenor sax. I thank God for the tenor sax that you play, Tony. Amen. If you've, uh, if you made a list, maybe it was longer than what you had time to express. Maybe you didn't say anything. But the point of this is, when when to, to just say, well, I'm thankful. How about expressing your thanks? If if my wife you know, goes for uh, a few weeks or months or a year and she doesn't hear me thank her or she doesn't hear me express appreciation or love to her, she, she, she'll think I don't love her anymore. She'll wonder, what's wrong? What is going on? And I can say, oh, well, I, I, I feel thankful. Well, really? You didn't say anything. How do you think God feels when we don't say anything to him? We come to church and we sing songs as if, you know, they're nothing. We come and we worship, but it's not really worship. It's just a routine that we go through. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, and His mercy endures forever. God is good all the time. All right. <laughs> and then thank Him for how He's treated us. He's given us so much. He's done amazing things for us. Specifically, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to save us. And then how he's treated us. You know, if someone could do all of that and kind of stand back, removed from the people that they're helping, but God has not done that. It's not Romans 5, it's Jeremiah, but it says, I have loved you, Jeremiah 31, 3, I forgot to change it in my outline. <laughs> I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love, with unfailing love. I have drawn you to myself. This was before Messiah came and was crucified and resurrected. But all from the ages past, before we were ever born, before man was, and, and woman was ever created, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love, unfailing love I've used to draw you to myself. God isn't trying to beat people into heaven through guilt. He's not trying to force people into heaven by fear of what the, what's gonna, what the flames are going to be like. If you're an Adventist, you think, well, it's just going to be black and nothingness. But if you're not an Adventist, you know, so those flames licking at your heels for eternity doesn't sound very good. I guarantee you there's going to be a point in every person's experience who, who has rejected Christ where they're going to wish that they had chosen differently doesn't matter if you believe it's, it's blackness or if it's flame. It doesn't really matter because the pain and the terror and the horror of being separated from God for eternity is enough to, to turn us to him. But God isn't trying to use fear tactics to get us into heaven. He loves us. He loves you and he loves me with an everlasting love. Because he loves us, he has forgiven us. He does not respond to our insults, to our offenses, to our foolishness in kind. He shows us not only forgiveness, but he shows us compassion and tenderness. That's why Psalm 103 says this, He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He is removed. Oh, come on, you guys read this with me. This is ridiculous. Come on, let's start over. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. 
He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. Amen? That's what our worship is to be about. It's about God. This great God, this Father God, this loving God, this saving God, this healing God, this compassionate God, this victorious God. So why why is our worship so tame? Not just here, but at home. I ask myself that. How can I go days and with just kind of like a, a, a perfunctory prayer to God or a, a blessing, or, and, and I don't spend time and just say, God, you're so amazing. Why is it so tame, so devoid of passionate joy and, and overflowing thankfulness? The thing I, I came up with the most is we, we bring our baggage, our stuff, to what we call worship, whether it's here or at home, but but we don't let it go. We just put in our time and hope we'll get something out of it instead of realizing God is hoping he'll get something out of it. Maybe this time, God is thinking, I'll get something out of this time, my together time with my people. (laughs) He's hoping he'll get us to let go of some of that junk. That's what he says. Come to me and, and let me have your burdens. God wants that. He's asked us for it. You don't have to be afraid of owning up to it and then giving it over to God. That's what Celebrate Recovery is all about. It's about being honest about what's really going on in your life, but then handing it over to God and letting him help you on the path to recovery. Well, we all need that. I'm surprised we don't have the place packed out on Friday nights here. Maybe we just need a little more honesty. I don't know. He's hoping he'll get honest and open acknowledgement. He's hoping we'll give him not only our troubles, but our praise, our thanks, our worship for who he is, for what he has done, for how he has loved us. I was reading in Psalm 50, one of the verses that came up was Psalm 50. Psalm 50 is a great chapter because it's like like a a chapter, a, a, a song in the Bible where God is like a roaring lion. And he starts out and he says, here, my people, I have something to say to you. I have an issue to, come to bring to you. And he starts talking to them about their worship. He starts talking about how they're, they're slaughtering bulls and calves. They're bringing things to him. They're, they're, they're bringing offerings, which God said do that. But, but they're doing all of their, their acts of worship just out of, uh, of obligation, just out of expectation. And, and God said, that's not what I want. I'm not interested in whether you figured out how to keep the Sabbath from sundown to sundown and you, you, know, you get out your charts. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in whether you, you come up with all the exact things that you think I expect. This isn't a mind-reading game where we figure out what God wants and then we kind of give it to him, kind of like you did in school. I did in school with my teachers in high school. I figured out what they want. That's what I gave them, and I got A's. Went to college and found out I actually had to do some work, and I got a lot less. That's, that's, not, that's not the relationship God is looking for or asking for. He's looking for our praise and our thanks and our worship. And, and at the end of Psalm 50, it sa- he says, Giving thanks is a sacrifice that truly honors me. Give thanks, yes. Give thanks as worship, yes. Give thanks, worshiping God. Thank you, God. When the foundation of of the temple was rebuilt after the Babylonian captivity, those who were present understood what God had done in bringing them back to Jerusalem and in helping them survive all the hellish challenges that they had in returning to this desolate place surrounded by enemies. Ezra the scribe recorded this scene as they met together to celebrate the foundation. He says, with praise and thanks, they sang this song to God, to the Lord. He is so good. His faithful love for Israel endures forever. Then all the people gave a great shout, praising the Lord. Ah, I'd love to come in here someday and hear North Hills Church give a great shout that praises the Lord. Not one that's coached from me or the worship, the singers, but one that just is like, it's overflowing. It's, it, it, we can't contain it because we see God for who he is. And we, we, we feel God for what he's done. 
Okay. No. Oh. We have one more thing to do, and this, this, you know, this is not a small part uh, of, of thanks. That is, when we give our offerings, when we give our offerings, are we giving God anything by giving our offerings? Let's say, let's say I give $5 in the offering plate. Is that giving God anything? Let's say it's 5000 It's For me, it's good for the church, you know. But God, God you know, he's not... He, he, loves honest, he loves honest and open and free, free will offerings and joyful giving, $5, 5000 50000 $5 million, that'd be okay, really. We've got a roof to fix and stuff to do here. But, but for God, he's got, he already has it. Our offerings are not about amounts. It's about our hearts. It's about, in a tangible way, saying, God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so we're going to do that today. We're going to end a little different. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward, and we'll, we'll have a prayer. Oh, I'll leave this here. Right. Uh, we'll have a prayer for the offering. But uh, as they're taking up the offering, we're going we're gonna, to, we're gonna like, join another church that did a video of thanks. I give thanks is the name of the song. And... Uh, uh, they, they don't know this, but North Hills Church is going to partner with Calvary Assembly in, in Eagle Rock, and we're just going to bring you one of the most joyful songs of thanksgiving that I've ever heard in my life, because God deserves it. I may not deserve what he's given me, but he sure deserves everything I can give from an own, uh, open and honest heart to him. So let's just pray and thank God. Thank you, Lord, for what you've given us for life and breath and for this, this amazing planet we live in and, and all that you, you provide for us. And thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us. Thank you for Jesus, our Savior. May we never forget his great salvation or his grace toward us, his forgiveness, your great love. And thank you, God, for how you've treated us as family, not as foreigners. You've treated us as friends, not enemies. And so these offerings that we give to you, our tithes and our offerings, we give to you, Lord, because we love you and we want to just say thank you in a, in a way that is more than words, but, but it's together with our words. So thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for loving us, we pray in Jesus' name.